you who are in Sunday school, we were in Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we we're looking this morning at uh, this, uh, this book of the Bible, this letter that was written um, by the Apostle Paul um, as a, it was a, it was a, it was a letter to this church in Philippi, and it was a prison epistle. He wrote it from prison, and so Paul writes this to this little suffering church, and uh, we looked in chapter number 1 at, um, at how uh, Paul calls them to be unified for the sake of the gospel, to stand firm um, together, to um, uh, strive side by side together for the faith of the gospel, and then also uh, he encourages them to not live in fear, because even if they go through suffering, it's actually a blessing to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I want us to look, uh, as he moves into chapter number 2, we'll pick up with verse number 1, and we're going to read all the way down through verse 11, but this morning I'm actually going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. So we're going to start in verse 5 with, our, uh, with the preaching this morning, but I, as we begin here, let me just start at verse 1 and read all the way through verse 11. He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, then he basically is giving an if-then statement. He says then, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And here's where our text picks up. What he's been saying here is ultimately wrapped up in this statement. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray this morning and ask God to help us as we look at this text. My goal today is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. May we see him, may we see who he is, and may we be like him. Let's pray. Father, um, would you please work? Lord, would you please help us today for the sake of your name, for the sake of your church, Lord, your glory. Lord, we want to see Jesus. Lord, would you please help us, uh, Lord, to have our eyes fixed on him. Lord, may we see who we are. May we see who he is. May we see what he came to do to change us. And then, Lord, may, now we, may we live for him. And, Lord, may we seek to be like him. Lord, would you please help us. In Christ's precious name. Amen. If you look in verse number five, there's a pretty tall order that's being given to us. He basically tells us to think this way. And he tells us how to think. It goes back to where he's been saying. He's been telling us to, to be like-minded, to esteem others better than ourselves, to be humble, um, to not just be caught up in our own interests, but 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 um, Pursuing the interest of other people. And then he says, let this mind be in you. Or basically, let this thinking be in you. Let us think this way. Now, how dare Paul tell us how to think? That's kind of a tough thing. Have you ever had somebody tell you to change the way you think? It's kind of hard. The older you get, the harder it is the way to change the way you think. I just turned 45, and I know I'm just a whippersnapper. But you know what? I'm a stubborn 45. I've been thinking this way for 45 years. Um, it's hard to think like somebody else. I kind of think like I think. This is a pretty tall order. 
But we are being commanded. I want you to know this isn't given to us as a suggestion. This isn't a, hey, why don't you try this? This is given to us as a command. We are being commanded to think like somebody else. Uh, this, this is tough. I'll never forget when, we, when, we, when I first uh, got married. I, I traveled on an evangelistic team. Um, and and kind of like the people on our team, um, I was a single on our, the, our team. We traveled with an evangelist named Steve Pettit. There was six singles. There was three guys, three girls. And uh, there was one particular girl on this team that I became very fond of. Um, she's sitting right over there. Um, and uh, as I get to know her, um, we, we, we start to, to be close. It's kind of funny. Uh, we kind of joke because uh, Steve Pettit had a no dating policy on the team. Um, thankfully, there wasn't a no marriage policy, and so it, it worked out for us okay. Um, but as we started uh, getting to know each other, I'm like, man, me and this girl, we are like, I mean, we, we are like so much alike. I mean, we, 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 we think the same way. We're, we're, we're on the same page. I mean, the more and more, the more and more I'm around her, I mean, I'm just like, this girl is incredible. I mean, we're like, we're like, I mean, we're on the same page all the time. And then we got married. And we started to realize we weren't exactly on the exact same page all the time. You know what I mean? I'll never forget, shortly after we got married, we continued to travel. And we were in, we were in Tennessee, uh, in, uh, close to Knoxville, Tennessee. And there was, uh, we would come into town. Typically, we had a Sunday to Friday meeting. And then we'd come into town on Saturday to the next church. And, and then as we were getting ready for uh, Sunday, um, I mean, Saturday night was like literally our only night that we had free. And so if we were ever going to sneak in a little date night, it had to be on a, on a Saturday night. So we were newly married. We'd been married less than a year. And, um, and we were in Tennessee, and there was this perfect, I mean, home run out of the park date spot that I found out about. It's this little place called Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> I, 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 I love, okay, I grew up in the outdoors. I love hunting and fishing, and I love the outdoors. And I'm, I, I mean, this place, it's like, I mean, all the wildlife, I mean, it's like a museum. You know, my, my wife loves animals and I mean this is going to be incredible and this one even has a Starbucks coffee right inside and she loves coffee and this is I mean, it's, it's been just a home run I'm, I'm telling you it's out of the park and we get there and she just kind of nestles into a camouflage chair and pulls out a book and I come to see her in a few minutes and she has fallen asleep how do you fall asleep at Bass Pro Shop um, you know it was very obvious very fast that we're not exactly on the same page all the time you know what it's a lifelong pursuit to learn to think like your spouse, how they think, how they work. Um, it is a tall order to be commanded, don't think like you, think like somebody else. But I want you to know in verse number five, that is exactly what we're being commanded to do. He says, let this which was also in Christ Jesus. Folks, we're not being commanded here to think like just any other person. We are being commanded here to take on, as a part of our thinking, how Jesus thought. Now what he does, starting in verse number 6, is he actually starts to walk into the mind of, of Christ. You don't have many passages. This is one of the most beautiful, theologically rich passages on, on, on Jesus Christ that we have in the scriptures. I mean, this is rich. It's really, it's really kind of a hymn that's laid out before us here that Paul gives us, and it's poetic in nature, but it is rich and it is deep because he actually moves into the mind, the thinking and the motives of Jesus Christ himself. And I want us to look at it. When he starts in verse 6, okay, as he comes to verse number 6, first of all, he wants to make a point that his listeners, and I want to make sure to make the point that my listeners, that you all know who I'm talking about. What, what, in verse number 6, he makes with two statements a very dogmatic statement as to who this man is. He's not just saying, hey, yeah, there's this great man out there that you ought to kind of shoot at 
um, at thinking like him as an example because he was pretty wise, he was pretty smart, he was pretty humble, whatever, whatever. He is, he wants to lay the foundation of who this man he's talking about is. When he talks about let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, look what he says, verse number six. He wants to make a very, very firm statement. And so he, does, he says it in back-to-back -back phrases. He makes a statement as to who this man is. It's not just anybody. It's God himself. Listen to what he says. Verse 6, who, talking about Jesus, being in the form of God. What does it mean, the word form of God? It's the very essence of God. It's the very character of God. It's a statement saying that God, I mean that Jesus Christ is God. And then listen to the next statement that he gives us to make the point. He says in the next statement, verse number 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It's a unique uh, statement. He basically says that, that deity, equality with God, was not something that Jesus didn't have, and like a robber will go and steal something that's not his and make it his. Jesus didn't look at equality with God as something that he had to go take and make his own. And the reason why he says he's making the point that Jesus, Jesus didn't have to steal deity. He was deity. He's God. So Paul here wants to make the statement before he gets into how it is that Jesus thought and what Jesus' mindset was that we are to emulate, that we are to command it to have. He wants to make a point that you understand who Jesus is. Do you know who Jesus is? If you're here today, I, I mean, I just, there's a lot of people who have a lot of great thoughts in their mind towards who Jesus is. We work in, in inner city Detroit through the summer. We work with a lot of Muslims. The Muslims will tell you Jesus was a great man. Jesus was a great prophet. I was talking to this one man. His name was Muhammad. And I'm talking to Muhammad. And he said, you know, I really don't understand the big difference between us and Christians. He said, I know that there's problems. He said, he said I mean, my whole life I've been taught that Jesus was a great man. I've been taught that Jesus was a great prophet. I've been taught that Jesus was a great example, that we should follow Jesus and, 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 and honor Jesus. I've been taught that my whole life. I don't understand why there's such tension between Muslims and Christians. I said, well, let me kind of help you out here, Muhammad. I said, Jesus claimed that he was God, and I believe him. And he goes, oh, okay, yeah, that's a problem. Folks, um, there's a lot of people who say a lot of good things about, about Jesus. But do you understand that at the bedrock foundation of the Christian faith, it is this, that God became a man, and his name is Jesus. We build our life on that, and we even die for it. Folks, this is foundational Christian doctrine, that God became a man, his name is Jesus, and that's who Paul's talking about. And so he wants to make a pretty firm statement in verse number 6 as to who he's talking about. But, I, you know, the, the wording here in the King James, i got to be honest, it's very convicting to me. Because while he's making a statement that Jesus Christ was not like a robber who wanted to be equal with God, so he's trying to steal his, his deity and call it his own. Jesus didn't have to do that because he was deity. But it's convicting because the flip side of it is that humanity, you know what, you know what our, our, our number one problem is? Is that we're, Jesus, Jesus is God. And didn't have to steal it. We're not God, but we try to steal it. Did you know that the struggle with humanity is that we all just kind of want to be God? You say, oh, I don't want to be God. Yeah, you do. Um, maybe you say, I don't want to rule the world. No, you don't want to rule the whole world. You just want to rule your world. We all just want to be the God who sits on the throne of our own little kingdom. And I just want you to know that in this passage, in looking at what we are commanded to do as we are being told to think like Jesus thinks, and then this passage shows us how he thought, that, that, that we've got to understand this is not naturally how we think. We all, we all want to be God. I mean, what does it look like for us to try to take little pot shots at deity or, or try to grab little handfuls of deity and steal it and call it our own? I mean, well, well we, um, we control and manipulate. We don't, nobody ever controls and manipulates circumstances, do we? Oh, we do it all the time. What we, when we don't get what we want, then what do we do? We, we complain. We murmur and complain. It's all just us saying, oh, we deserve, I deserve better than this. This doesn't serve my kingdom well. We sin, just flat out sin. We know what God wants. We say, God, I don't want to do what you want to do. I want to do what I want to do. Because I want to be king on the throne of my own kingdom. When we don't pray, 
We're saying, God, maybe you're there, maybe you're not. I don't care. I don't need you. Um, we have so many things in our life in which we just want to be God. You know, it's the mindset of this world. It's called humanism. It's, it's really that, that, that you're in control. It's all about you. We see this in our children. I'll never forget when Ella was just a little girl. Where's Ella? She's sitting over here. When she was just a little girl, we would work with her all the time. We just kind of wanted from a very young age to work with our kids to help them to see. I mean, at the end of the day, you just, we're, we're, we're loving stuff. That's why we sin. We love ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves. It's all about me. It's all about me. Ella, who is that all about? What, what, who were you serving up there? All of well, I was serving myself. It was all about me. And I'll never forget one time we met my wife and I. Ella was just little, probably four or so. Or so and, and, and my wife and I are sitting in our chairs. And there was one morning, and Ella had some little baby dolls out. And she's playing, and she's going, me, 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 me. It's all about me. It's all about me. And I remember we were just sitting there looking at her. We're kind of laughing. And, and, um, and so we kind of interrupted her. Hey, Ella. She kind of piped up. Huh? And I said, hey, baby, who are you singing now? She goes, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Um, and you know it's kind of it's kind of cute, I guess, when it's a four year old and and um, and they're saying it's all about me. You know it's not cute anymore when it's a 54, 34, 44, 54, 60, 40 year old and still the mantra of life is it's all about me. It's not. And that's the difference between our mindset and Jesus's mindset. Folks, we are not the king. He is. We are not deity. We just want to be. He is. And I want you to listen to what it says he does as deity. Look at verse number seven. Verse number seven. Um, verse number seven. We start to, to see his mind thinking and his motivation and what's going on in verse number seven it says but okay so verse verse six who he is who made him who being in the form of god the very essence of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross now, there's several things here that I think we could draw from. I'm going to really, when it comes to his mindset, when it comes to his thinking, I think there's two things that I really want to draw out today. That, that are, if we are going to think like Christ, if we're really going to make this our goal and our aim to be obedient to this command in verse 5, to think this way, the way Jesus thought, I think there's two things that I want us to look at. Um, and, and, and we see here in verse number 7, he says that, um, who, who being in the form of God, thought not Robert to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That phrase, it's kind of a unique phrase, to be honest, in the King James, because it's actually a phrase that, that comes from one single Greek word. It's the Greek word kineo, and what it means is to empty, to pour out. That's what the word means. That Jesus Christ, though he was God, it says he poured himself out. He emptied himself. Now, does this, we got to be careful here because it's real easy and it, 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 it's, it's an error, it's wrong for us to say that he, that he poured out his deity as the, uh, uh, in saying that he, he ceased to be God when he was a man. Jesus Christ was, was, tru was truly, completely God and truly and completely man at the same time. It's not like when he became a man and he emptied himself that he ceased to be God. He was fully God and fully man at the exact same time. And you can't take away from that. Okay? He was full. And we can't wrap our brain around that. I mean, we can't wrap our brain around the incarnation that God became fully man. But what we're, what we're looking at here is, is, is the incarnation and the how, how incredible it is that God took up on himself full humanity. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the implications of this in his life in just a minute. He made himself nothing. He made himself of no reputation. The Greek word is literally, he emptied himself. Okay? In this emptying himself, this passage, his theology.
theologically been, uh, has been called the kenosis passage, the, the kenosis of Christ, Christ emptying himself out, pouring himself out. It's not that he ceased to be God. It's that there's things about deity that he laid aside for the sake of taking on humanity. Jesus Christ, he emptied himself, for instance. Well, the, 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 here's, the, here's, the, here's the two mindsets that I want you to see today. The two mindsets that Jesus Christ showed us, that he had on this earth as a man, that I think that we're being commanded and should emulate, um, really seek to obey this command, to, to think this way, is I think Jesus Christ, first of all, was a man who was full of humility. And second of all, hand in hand with this, is that Jesus Christ was a man who was, now this, 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 we need to let this sink in and shock us, he was obedient. Jesus Christ was, was humble, and Jesus Christ was obedient. And if we're going to be like him, these two things I want to draw out of today, that we have got to be people who are humble and that we've got to be people who are obedient. Okay, let's look at, first of all, this humility, this humbleness. So Jesus, in emptying, emptying himself out, look at verse number seven. It says, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The... Um, but just think with me, in, in becoming a man, Jesus laid aside, he emptied himself of, 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 I mean, he emptied himself of his heavenly abode. Jesus Christ, for eternity past, had dwelt in the presence of, of the Holy Trinity, God the Father and God the, the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And he steps out of that place. And he comes to this earth. He lays aside his heavenly abode. And he comes to this earth and he lives among these people who have rebelled against him. Um, uh, what if God the Father gave you the job of assigning to Jesus an earthly dwelling place? Where would you personally put Jesus? I mean, if, I, if, if God the Father gave me this, the job of assigning to Jesus a place on earth for his son to dwell, I mean, I would put him in the most incredible place I could find on the, place of the, on the face of this earth. But what did Jesus choose for himself? He grew up in Nazareth of Galilee. We talked about it in Sunday school. A little bitty crossroads of a community in the poor part of the country. He, he laid aside his heavenly abode. We find Jesus himself saying to, to those who thought they wanted to follow him, he said, just so you know, the foxes have their holes, the birds of the air have their nests. I don't always have a place to lay my head. You sure you want to follow me? He laid aside his heavenly position. He's the king. Folks, we're talking about the man who spoke the universe into existence. We're talking about the, the one who did that. The book of Colossians says that all things were created by him, the second person of the Godhead, the Son. The one who spoke all things into existence. He lays aside his heavenly position. What if God the Father gave you the job of assigning Jesus an earthly position when he was here? What would you make Jesus? A king? Uh, the president? At least the governor of some, somewhere nice. But what did he take upon himself? What position? Look at verse number seven. It says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself, took upon him the form of a servant. Look at verse 6. He was just in the form of God. Same word. Now he's in the form, the very essence, the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. Folks, he laid aside his heavenly abode. He laid aside his heavenly position. He came to this earth to dwell among us. And he came to be a servant. The word here, servant, is the word that really is translated and, and understood, it, it's a slave, a bond slave. This is why Jesus Christ came, and Jesus Christ made the statement, I came not to be served, I came not to be ministered to, but I came to minister. I came to give my life a ransom. I think the most one of the most beautiful pictures we have of this is Jesus Christ the night before he died. He's in the upper room with his disciples. 
It's so, it's so interesting as you take a harmony of the Gospels and you put it together, you, you kind of find out a little bit, uh, not all at one account, but you take the harmony of the Gospels and you put it together and you start to understand some of the things that took place in that evening and you kind of can piece a few things together. I can't help but wonder when it was that we come to John chapter number 13. But, but you can't help but wonder if it's not after this discussion comes up. Because we know that in the upper room there's a discussion that comes up. It's come up many times before. What was the discussion? The disciples begin to bicker as to which of them is going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Remember, remember this had come up before. James and John had, had even come in and their mom had asked if one could sit on his right and one on his left in the kingdom. And the others kind of got upset with them. There's this bickering. There's this jockeying for position. They're self-focused, self-centered because they're self-righteous. You know what the, 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 the sorry disciples, you know what their problem was? They were just a lot like us. And you can't help but wonder, right as you come to that point of them bickering back and forth, that that's right at the moment you come to John chapter 13. And you got this beautiful passage of, of just some incredible grammar where you've got all of these words that lead up to the action that Jesus does. It says that Jesus, his time has come. He knows his time has come. He's come from God. He's going back to God. He knows that all things have been given into his hands. It says that he knows that it's already been put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. But then listen to these verbs. It says, but he loved them to the end. <coughs> he wasn't done loving them. So it says, supper being ended, he rose from the table. He took a basin of water. He got down on his hands and knees and he started to wash their dirty feet. The lowest job of the lowest slave on the totem pole. This wasn't done at some weak point in Jesus' life. Just a few hours later, when the soldiers come to Gethsemane to arrest him, and they, he says, who are you looking for? And they tell him who, and then he says, I am he, and at the words, I am, the whole garrison of soldiers fall down. This is at no weak point. This is at a powerful point that he gets on his knees and he washes his feet. He was a servant. I have a friend of mine, his name is Rand Hummel. He, he was at the wilds for years and now he works, he runs the wilds of New England, up in New England. And I, I, I remember Rand one time telling me a story about being on a plane and there was, um, there, there, there was, it was a, oh, it was a packed flight. It was um, all these people, it was hot. The, the, they're delayed um, at, at the gate. Then they get out on the runway and there's a problem, they're delayed again. And people are, it was hot. There was people fussy, there was crying babies. It was just, it was like a, a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, this one lady, he said, this, this, um, uh, the flight attendant, she was like, she, she saved the day. She was just kind. She's communicating. She's helping babies. She's helping older gentlemen who were having a hard time. And she's just talking to people or asking questions. She keeps, she, he said, she just, she, her, her attitude and just, just being kind and serving just, I mean, just made the whole thing uh, not, 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 not be so bad. He said when they, they, they take off, they finally get there, and as he's leaving the flight, he just, as he's walking by, he said, hey, I just want to thank you for being such a servant today. She was offended. She said, no, I'm not a servant. Folks, I want you to know something. Jesus Christ took upon himself the form of a slave, a servant. He was he was a servant. And he came so that he could serve me and you. This is why he did it. This is why he came. So that he could be our servant. I mean, if you just think about, if you just think about the, 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 the incarnation, him becoming a man. Jesus Christ, he's 100% totally, fully God, but he takes upon himself the full dose of humanity. You know what? Jesus Christ, God, he got hungry. He got thirsty. He, 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 I mean, so many different things. He got tired. He got emotional. He, he had to sleep. 
does that mean? He took on, he took on full humanity with all of its limitations, with all of its weaknesses, with all of its struggles. He became a man. Um, I love even, I mean, th these things don't sound godlike. I love the, the phraseology of the King James where it says he made himself of no reputation. You know why that's so convicting to me? Because I have a reputation I want. We all do. We want to be perceived in a certain way. I mean, sure, you know, the American dream is to be healthy, wealthy, and beautiful. I mean, I, you know, hopefully we've all given up on that a long time ago. Um, but, but really, how do you want to be perceived? I mean, we want to be perceived as, as good. We want to be perceived as wise. We want to be perceived as savvy in our business dealings. We want to be, I mean, we want to be perceived as spiritual. I mean, I want to be perceived as spiritual. I mean, I think I come in, I want, I want pastor to think I'm spiritual. You've got to understand something about Jesus. Please understand me, folks. On the day he died, they didn't even think he was spiritual. At the beginning of the week on Palm Sunday, they're waving their branches, they're beating them on the ground saying, Hosanna, the king is coming. By the end of the week, the same people have been convinced that he was a blasphemer. They're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Isaiah 53 says that they, were cons they considered him smitten of God. They didn't even think he was spiritual. Folks, he literally made himself nothing. Why? So he could save me. So he could be my servant. And we are being commanded to think this way. Are you a servant? Are you okay being a servant? Do you serve your wife? Do you serve your husband? Do you serve your church? I mean, selfless, washing feet, sir. This is who our Jesus is, and we're being commanded to think this way. And I want you to see, just as we close here, the last thing. Um, is it says in verse number 8, look at verse number 8. So we've seen his humility, we're being commanded to think this way, his mindset of a humble servant. But then look at verse number 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And then listen to this. And became obedient. Now just stop right there. Those words ought to shock us. We just got through talking about the one who spoke and the universe came into existence. I was just, I was just, we were just talking to, to, to my son Joby. My four-year-old, this morning, my wife and I are sitting side by side in our chairs reading our Bible, and he got up early. We're, 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 we're going through the time change. It's like, no, you should be asleep for another hour. But we just came from Eastern time zone. So he woke up early, and he snuggled up in, 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 in Stephanie's lap, and we were talking to him, and, and she was just talking to him through some of the stuff that we're going through in their little, in their little Bible, Bible study we're doing with them. And she was just asking, you know, what did, what did, what did God make everything from? Did he make it from Plato? And he's like, no, he didn't make it from Plato. He made it out of nothing. Who made it out of nothing? This man made it out of nothing. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, before he ever became a man, he spoke everything into existence. And here we find him. This phrase needs to shock me. He became obedient. When you're at the top of the food chain, you don't exactly have to obey other people. Folks, we find this phrase, and it needs to shock us, because I think herein lies the daily struggle of the Christian life. We simply struggle. But Jesus Christ didn't just tell us to do it. He showed us. We find, we find Jesus going from co-equal in the command of giving to being completely subservient to his father. Jesus himself said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. 
I think the most powerful demonstration or explanation of this practically is just a few hours later. He leaves the upper room. He goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane. Have you, have you ever wrestled through? There's tension here that needs to be welcome tension. Because you know what you find in the Garden of, of Gethsemane? You find this massive tension between his deity and his humanity. As he is at a point of such pressure <coughs> that he begins to sweat blood. And we find Jesus praying a prayer that is just, it needs to blow our mind as we try to wrestle through it. As, as the son says to the father, and he, and, he, and he prays to him three different times. He comes away and he prays the same way. And he pictures in his prayer a cup that he's supposed to drink. What's in the cup? I mean, obviously, we would understand and feel the pain in his mind of understanding. He knows what the Bible says. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. As, as he pictures this cup, obviously in it is the suffering, the beating, the, the, the whip, the crown of thorns, the mockery, the blasphemy from the very people he created and came to save. But ultimately, even beyond that, you know what's in the cup? Ultimately, it's the wrath of God that's in the cup that he is to drink. You see, the wrath of God that deserved to be poured out on me and you, Jesus Christ, is going to take that cup and he is to drink it. The wrath of God. And he comes in prayer to the Father and he says, as a man, he says, is there some other way? Can this cup pass? Is there some other way? Well, you know what? This is the submissive heart that we are to emulate. This is the submissive heart that we are to seek after. This is the obedience of Christ. What did he say? He didn't finish the prayer there. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. You know what I find in my life? I find myself at those points a lot of times. God, isn't there some other way to really have to do this? God, I mean, do I, I mean, is this really what you want me to do? I mean, God, it just seems like everybody else is going this way, and everybody, it just seems like the whole world's doing this, and is this really? And folks, we are at this tension point of, of obedience over and over and over and over again in our life. And I have a question for you. Are we going to be like Jesus? Are we going to think like Jesus Christ said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do your will. I'm going to do your will. And for him, that meant death. He said, and you see the verse, verse number eight, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, and not just any death, even the death cross. Folks, can I tell you something? I heard a preacher one time. I don't remember who it was. But it was just at a, at a real point in my life of really deciding, what, what, what are you going to do? And I became a Christian when I was 21 years old. I became a follower of Christ. And, um, but I, 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 and then I started, in, I started training for ministry because I really felt like that's what God wanted me to do. But I had just some tension points. And a lot of it was just through some struggles in my own heart, in my own life. And I had, had times where it was hard. And I just, it just I mean, I could get, go into the details. But um, this is still when I was, I was, I was young, in my 20s, I wasn't married. Um, and I just, I, it just came to some points where I really felt like, you know what, I don't want to do this. Um, and just really, really coming to the point where I felt the tension between God's kingdom and my kingdom, and I knew that they both could not coexist. And I'll never forget listening to a preacher and talking about the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, the Garden of Gethsemane is a place where Christians need to go often. And the Garden of Gethsemane is a place where you die. And he actually didn't say that Golgotha is a place where you die. That's the place where Jesus actually died. But, but the battle of Gethsemane, where, where he took his, where, where, where he said, it's not my will, it's yours. I'm going to, I'm going to do your will. And I 
I'm going to come into a place of tension and come into a place where I, I, I it, it was a death. I had to die to my, my plans that I, you know, was starting to have. I had to die to a future that I thought maybe could happen. Because we got to, we, we got to, it's a dying to this thing. There is a death. My, my father-in-law, he was a very successful businessman, made tons of money, worked in the business world. He um, got a, 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 a degree in engineering from Rose Holman, um, and, then, and then he goes on for an MBA, and he um, is just very successful. He has tons of money. He's working for this company, gets a better offer, go to this company. This co company finds out, gives him a better offer, go here. He just pops around, making tons of money. I mean, they got it rolling. Um, 42, I think it was years old, calls in the family, my wife, my sister-in-law, my mom-in-law, calls them all in, says, hey, hey, girls, listen, I want to know what's going on. Man, I think I want to be in ministry. And so he quits his job, goes to seminary. Um, he, he then starts working for Bob Jones University. He takes, I mean, it's like close to a 75% He's got unsaved family members who think he's got a bonkers. Can I tell you where my father in law is? I mean, I think he's a hero. Okay. He is a man. He, listen, he has eyes. He has not physical eyes, he has spiritual eyes. And he can see that there is a real kingdom whose builder and maker is God. And that you're no fool to give up in this life that you can't keep anyway. Yeah. As Jim Elliott told us, to, to gain in, in that life what you can never, ever, ever lose. And so there's a death that, yeah, it's hard at the moment, but there is eternal benefit, eternal reward. And folks, we are the people who by hope we grab a hold by faith in what we believe. Folks, whose kingdom are you gonna are you gonna live for? You see, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ as a man, he comes to this earth and he had this mindset of humility and servitude, of submission and obedience. All looking forward to the joy, Hebrews 2. The joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Despised the shame. And folks, I want you to know something. We, we endure the cross. We endure the shame if need be. We endure. We become like Christ. We follow him. If it means suffering, we suffer. If it means death, we die. But folks, ultimately, it's because we know he's worthy and we believe in his story and not just the story of the cross. We believe what happened next on the third day he rose again. And now look at verse number 9, 10, and 11. Where is now? He, it says, wherefore God also now hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, he has been exalted. And folks, you know what his exaltation means? His exaltation is just a foreshadowing of our exaltation. Folks, he, he, he rose from the dead. He ascended up into heaven. He sat down beside the right hand of the throne of God. The work is finished. And his position at the right hand of the throne of God, I am in Christ. I am hidden in Christ. Did you know that what that means is someday I'm going to be with him. I also, that's what we call our exaltation. We are, we, we have been saved, our justification. We're in the process of this process of sanctification, but there is going to come an exaltation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Do you live for that? Folks, I don't want the glories of this life. They will fade away. I want to serve a king who's going to live forever. And his name is Jesus Christ. One day we will get this right. Every knee shall bow and tongue confess. But folks, we do this now. Our knee bows, our tongue confesses. We let this humility that we saw in our Jesus now be the humility that we live in. We let this servitude that we saw in our Jesus for our own selves, we now have this servitude in our hearts as we dwell in this church and with our families and our people. This obedience and submission that we saw in our Jesus, we now live this in our life. Folks, we let our knee bow, we let our tongue confess who he is. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you really a follower of Jesus Christ? Is he your king? You know, I say that carefully because I think there's a lot of people who want Jesus as a savior. We, we, we say the phrase, you know, um, accept Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your savior. And that's a, that's a unique phrase because Lord and savior, those are two different aspects of Jesus Christ to you. And did you know there's a lot of people who want him as a savior, but don't want him as a Lord. We kind of, we kind of, we, we, we want part of Jesus. We want a Savior. What does it mean that we have him as a Savior? That means he gets us out of hell. Man, there's a lot of people who want Jesus as a Savior. But they don't want him as a Lord. Lord means he's in control. Lord means he's your king. Folks, Jesus didn't just come to be your Savior. He came to be your Lord. I think that was me. I grew up in church. I grew up going to Sunday school. I grew up, I prayed a prayer when I was five years old. I heard this high power preacher preaching about sin and hell. Pray these words, you won't burn forever. That's what I heard. He probably didn't say that, but that's what I heard. As a five-year-old, I prayed to him, Lord, I got to say these words, I don't want to burn forever. And, and I'm not saying that a five-year-old can't get saved. I think a five-year-old can get saved. I just don't think this five-year-old can get saved. Because you know what? My life looked just like that. I wanted Jesus as a Savior, but I didn't want him as a Lord. I didn't want to obey him. I don't want to serve him. I don't want to live for him. I want to live for myself. I wanted him as a savior. Get me out of hell? I'll take that. I saw Jesus as a fire escape. I saw Jesus as some fire insurance. I wanted him as a savior. I didn't want him as a Lord. Folks, it comes, it, it's hand in hand. This passage is talking about understanding that Jesus Christ the Lord. Are we submitted to him? Are you submitted to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? I think if initially you make sure you're, you're saved. You make sure you're a true believer. And then, and then beyond that, this whole deal with him, so he's your Savior, but then the deal with him being Lord, I don't know about you. I mean, he's my Lord. I've made this decision. I will follow Jesus Christ. He saved me. He's my Lord. But you know what? I, my flesh is so real. My flesh is so nasty. You know what my flesh wants to do every day of my life? Kind of crawl back on the throne of my own little kingdom. It's every day of my life. It's, every, it's an everyday battle of saying no to myself and yes to God. No to myself and yes to God. It's the constant. The prayer of my life is constantly, Lord, you know me. You know what a turkey I am. God, I need you once again, a fresh and new today. God, you are the Lord of this life. You're my king. Help me to serve you. Help me to love you. Folks, this is, this is what it looks like to think like Jesus. Humility. Servitude. Obedience. To him. You know, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what your heart is towards Jesus Christ. Is he your savior and your king? May we submit ourselves. May we be like him. Let's have our heads bowed.